Peter Lombard's prologue on St. Paul, a clear distinction is introduced in absolutely impersonal terms, followed, as each term is defined and new divisions are proposed, by a series of other distinctions. The purpose of the procedure is indicated. The aim is to acquire knowledge, skiendum quod, and the way to obtain it is the quaestio, quirator quire. St. Paul's epistles are subjected to the same type of investigation as might be applied to any other historical document. Problems of authenticity, of dating, of situation, and form are examined in succession. For each problem, the solutions of preceding authors, auctoritates, are presented first, and then from among these, the teacher chooses one solution. Thus, the purpose of the commentary and of its prologue is to resolve the problems which arise in objective history. The sources used are the ancient commentators, particularly Pelagius, known through St. Jerome and Haimo, and among Lombard's contemporaries, Gilbert de la Pere. This text, of one of the greatest of the 12th century scholastics, has little that is personal. But this is precisely what made it valuable and explains its influence in the tradition of the school. Let us now compare this text with another example of how scripture was taught, but this time in a monastic milieu. In order to have a parallel text whose topic is the same, and which is also an introduction to a commentary, let us read the first of St. Bernard's sermons on the canticle. From the very first words, a totally different note is sounded. To you, my brother, I, may say, I must say something different from what I say to others, to those in the world, or in any case, I must say it in a different way. And what follows enlarges on the same theme. This is no mere interpersonal, impersonal discourse. A man speaking in the first person is addressing his readers or a specially selected audience and giving them instruction aimed directly at them. And who are they? They are not laymen destined to receive instruction in the faith of the apostles, such as required for all. They're spiritual men who must have the doctrina spiritus. They are the perfect to whom, according to St. Paul, words of wisdom must be spoken. Sapientiam loquimor. They are men who, long for, for, who for a long time have been concerned with celestial realities and who make these the object of their meditations by day and by night. In a word, they are contemplatives. They have both the right and the need to receive instruction in doctrine, an authentic sacred doctrine, in other words, a theology. But a theology closely related to the monastic experience, which is simply a life of faith led in a monastery. This theology assumes on the part of the teacher and on the part of his audience, a special way of life, a rigorous asceticism, or as they say today, a commitment. Rather than speculative insights, it gives them a certain appreciation of savoring and clinging to the truth and what is everything to the love of God. Our reading is from Dom Jean Leclerc's On the Love of Learning and the Desire of God, and you are listening to Path to the Academy. Welcome to Path to the Academy, where we talk about all, all things having to do with education, the creation of a permanent culture, and the pursuit of the good, true, and the beautiful. Today's guest, if you haven't recognized his voice, is none other than Father Patrick Henry Reardon. I think for almost every listener of ancient faith, Father Pat needs no introduction. If he does, then please pause this and go listen to a bunch of his sermons. I will only say... That he's retired Archpriest of All Saints Orthodox Church Chicago and currently a senior editor of Touchstone Journal. I would say he's a man of vast reading and education, but that would undersell it. 
He's also a man of many fascinating acquaintances. Father Pat, welcome to Path to the Academy. So glad to be with you, Gary. So, Father Pat, it uh, I, I know I asked you to do this a long time ago, well, several months ago, and it seems that uh, in retirement, you probably are busier than when you were served as a priest. Might, might that be a fair assessment of your life? No, but I am much weaker. I don't have anything like the vitality and drive, uh, and so I, I take things more slowly, so it takes more time. I'm finding, in fact, more taxing to get through the Psalter every week mm. than I did when I was working around the clock. I, mm. but, uh, but get through the Psalter, I must, because that seems to me a, a minimum. Right, right. How do you order your uh, your readings? Just following this, the 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 order, I, I, or I follow I follow the canonical hours. Yes, I pray the canonical hours, and I do the distribution of the Psalms pretty much day by day as they're distributed in the Rule of Saint Benedict. But per, but they're proportioned uh, differently. I don't I don't pray nocturnes, for example. Mm. Saint Benedict has twelve Psalms at nocturnes every day. But I do, since I don't pray nocturnes, then those 12 psalms will be distributed through the other hours during the course of the day. Right, right. Ah, uh, okay. And um, so to, tonight, I'm actually not recording this in uh, the St. Raphael studio in Emmaus. This is actually being recorded in Chicago. And so this will appear not only on Path the Academy, but also uh, on Father Pat's website. And so uh, to use a term I don't think I've ever used before, uh, we're doing this, um, oh, what is the term the young ones use? We're having a crossover episode um, of uh, I'm okay. something like that. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've asked Father Pat to join me today uh, for some rem reminiscences on a number of men, uh, particularly on the well-known Trappist Thomas Merton, uh, and on someone known to many Orthodox, I wish he was known by many Orthodox, and that is the late Jim Forrest, who for many years headed up the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. And if time permits us, uh, I hope we can speak about two rather important um Catholic thinkers from the last century that Father Pat had occasion to know, namely uh, Dom Jean Leclerc, who we just read from, but also Henri de Lubac. And there are, of course, a great many other characters in between that we can touch on. So, Father, if we could start with Merton. So you penned an article on Merton a little over a decade ago for Touchstone. And before I go any further as I do every time I mention Touchstone, any of my listeners need to subscribe to Touchstone. Um, I devour that journal every time I get it, sometimes more than once. I love it. I will admit, Father Pat, that you're the second author I generally go to. I generally go to Tony Esselin first. I don't know why I developed that ungodly habit, but then no, I go No, no, no. On, on the contrary, that's a wise, that's a wise choice. I would go to Esselin first, too. <laughs> So anyway, but but Touchstone, you did this article on Merton, uh, and uh, you mentioned um, that this memoir was sparked by uh, accompanying Jim, the late Jim Forrest, on a trip to Gethsemane Monastery, and you mentioned Jim's biography of Merton as one of the better ones. And for those who don't know, you know, Jim was head of the Peace Orthodox Peace Fellowship. But what did you think that made Jim's biography such a good read? And why was it that Jim could write it? Jim's biography is the only biography I can think of written by somebody who actually knew Merton for a long time. You know, some of Merton's, one in particular, Merton's classmates uh, at Columbia wrote the very first one, The Man in the Sycamore Tree, mm -hmm. which is a really, a, re a really very poorly constructed book. Mm. Uh, but but there's somebody who had lost contact with Merton, or at least 
not not so lively a contact with Merton for many years, but who followed him from afar. Um, Mott, who wrote the definitive official biography of Merton, did not know Merton. And he was called in, in fact, um, because John Hart Griffiths, whom Merton had chosen to write the biography, John Hart Griffiths passed away from cancer after mm. the experiments with, with his uh, his book, Black, My, Black Like Me. Mm. But they, 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 Jim Forrest, Jim Forrest could, could talk to Merton from the inside. And, and Jim's a, Jim was a remarkable writer anyway. He's, the people he knew, he wrote a biography of Daniel Ber of Dan Berrigan, for example. Um, if you look at Jim's own autobiography, I think God writes with crooked lines or something like that. Maybe it's an autobiography. Uh, his descriptions of people he knew over the years are very vivid, quite accurate, engaging. Jim was a marvelous. Jim was a marvelous writer. I wish he had written a great deal more, and but been a lot less involved in other things. How did Jim know? Uh... Uh, Thomas Merton. He describes that in, in the biography itself. He made a trip to Gethsemane uh, in response to, uh, I think, an invitation from Merton because both of them were very much engaged in um, peace activism back during, back during the Vietnam War. Um, and in fact, that's how I came to know Jim myself. Mm-hmm. When I came back from my studies in Europe in 69, I was, the, the, of course, the, the Vietnam War was still going on. And I myself had very strong feelings about this. And sometime in the fall of 1970, I wrote to Jim to introduce myself. And that, that began my own friendship with Jim, which lasted until his passing this past year. Right, right. And um, I mean, I, I, I picked up the biography because I hadn't read it. And so I picked it up. I started going through it. Then, of course, it's really quite, um, I mean, it's very enjoyable to read. I haven't finished it. I mean, I, I still have it right here. A great but, stylist. Uh, great stylist. Yeah. It is. And there's so much, I mean, I had known things. I had known about his, you know, his time at Columbia and his continuing relationship with the English professor there, Van Dorn. Um, but um but so much I didn't know about Merton. I just, he had, of course, written Seven Story Mountain. Um, and uh, it, you know, his his debt to Dante, which he had picked up at Clare College. I, I had not known he had gone to Clare College, which actually was Bill Ty's college. Um, I forgot about that. Right. Yeah. So anyway, um so you, you lamented in your essay, Merton's leaving aside his monastic pursuits for political action. Um, would that include, would, would you also censure his anti-war activism? Was this part of it? Was his, him not being as, let's say, monkish as he should be? I mean, I'm just a little um, curious, I would say. I, I don't want to fault Merton as a monk. I certainly don't want to try to get inside his head to see what drove him. But just simply looking from the outside, it, it seems to me that one cannot really give oneself to serious contemplative prayer and the study of the Word of God. Just the time and energy it takes to be involved in political, geopolitical questions and taking a... a uh, a, a strong stance, long a strong stance. Now, Merton would probably say that the uh, the peace activism. Actually, he would probably say this. I think he actually did say it. That peace activism on the part of a monk would be something something along the, the social activities of the eighth century literary prophets. Hmm. I mean, look, look at look at uh, look at the, the the Book of Amos, for example, who seems to know everything that's going on in the world. You know, even the for the six. For three for three transgressions of Syria or Damascus and for four, I mean, he runs through it. Clearly, Amos knows all of this material, but the works of the work of Amos is just just a few pages of the Bible. Merton's writing on these subjects fills shelves, right? So my my critique of Merton would be rather like that of um, oh Father Seraphim Rose. 
who had strong reservations about Merkin. Hmm. But, but my my critique would be in that direction. Right, right. Yeah, it's um because I I know that uh Don, that Father Jean Leclerc he wasn't writing on social issues, and I will say I cannot find his book on the contemplative life. Um, nobody has it in the used book markets, and it's really not in any of the libraries at all near me. Um, but he also commented one time he had traveled to over 50 countries. And he says, it's kind of hard to be a contemplative in that type of scenario, though I know he wanted to be, but I know that he had, let's say, another vocation as a teacher as well. But um, Talking talking to John Leclerc and talking to Thomas Merton were two entirely different experiences. Yes. John Leclerc was a contemplative, deeply contemplative. Mm. Uh, Jean Leclerc was a man of constant prayer. Um, he's one of those people who, like um, the late uh, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, never had to read anything twice. Wow! And uh, he was a man who used his time very well. Uh, um, Father John was ex- describing to me one day back when he was a student at San Anselmo. In fact, I was a student at San Anselmo when he told me the story. Back in those days, the theology taught at San Anselmo was neo scholasticism. Mm. And Jean Leclerc found that so distasteful that he, 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 while the classes were going on, he was sitting quiet in the back of the room reading the complete works of Cardinal Newman. <laughs> I will confess. But the same, thing is, the, thing is, the same thing is true, by the way, of Von Baldassar. Mm. Von Baldassar used to put wax in his ears when he was studying theology. Uh, and, and we're talking about he was studying theology at Fruvier Lyon, which had a great faculty. But he found that he found the theology so trite that he plugged his ears and he sat there. And while he was listening to these lectures, sitting in the back of the room, he was writing his he was writing his book on St. Maxim as the Confessor. They thought he was taking notes on the lecture. I I will have to confess, Father, that sitting in the back of my Anglican seminary, I was doing things less uh I was not listening to some of the lectures, and I was doing things less edifying than writing a book on St. Maximus. Um but um but I mean it's yeah, I mean that's a uh, that's a great picture, that comparison. Um I did the yeah. same thing. I did the same thing as Son of the Sumbo, for example. Oh yes. I was taking a course by Don Beckish, who was Hungarian, and uh, I just found this. I found the, the lecture so boring that I sat in back and I, 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 I was reading Baldwin of Canterbury in volume two hundred and four of Means Latin Patrology because I was, I was, I was writing. I was, I did, I just, I did on Sun and Summer in one year, so I was writing my, my, my thesis while I was doing all these other things. Now, I would never have done that. I would never have done that with the, the really fine professors I had there, such as Manus Bleur, for example, uh, Augustine Meyer. I would never have done that with them. Right. Much less, you know, uh, uh, much less the professors over at the Biblical Institute. When you were at San Anselmo, where was, because um, I remember that came came about, of course, Bill Ty sends those emails and everybody comments about them once in a while. Um, on Reginald Foster, who just passed away recently, did you know him when you were in Rome? No, no, I did not. No, I, I'm, I was there long before he was. Okay, okay, okay. All right, and um, but I'm but I'm familiar with Reginald Foster, of course. Right. Oh, I love his book. I love his book. It's just such a wealth, um, and it's helped me immensely. I mean, my uh, my Latin is all of a particular type of classical learning, and. Um, I mean, I tell people that I actually had the worst professor in the world the first time I ever took Latin, which was me, because I picked up a, a really poor Latin grammar. And um, but I had had years of Greek and I thought, oh, this should be easy. And uh, well, no, <laughs> but regardless. Um, so back back to Merton, though, I, I can easily wander away. And that's how these conversations end up most of the time, Father. <laughs> But um, well, Merton, my other, if you recall, my other reservation about Merton was his intense interest in the religions, religions of India. Mm. 
with which with which I feel absolutely no sympathy at all. Do you know what drove him to that, or did he confess? I should say. No, he see he got interested in that, but before he ever before he ever became a Christian, he was mm -hmm. already he was already pursuing. He, he was he was intensely interested in man's religious experience. Right. Well, and 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 Merck, Merck was very experiential in things. In fact, I I attended a series of lectures he gave on Sunday afternoons on the prophets, and uh, he he himself drew drew the distinction. He understood the distinction between the prophetic uh, service of God and the quest for religious experience. Merton understood. Merton very much understood that distinction. Right. But he, but he, but he chose the other. <laughs> he mm -hmm. chose the other. Wow. But that, see, Merton was Merton. Merton was dominated by the thing called mysticism. You know, and and I just I. I have I just have an innate problem with mysticism. Um, as Cardinal Newman says, someplace anything that begins in mist and ends in schism, you got to wonder about it. <laughs> it's a um, yeah. I'm, I I had a professor at uh, at Rutgers who was keenly interested in these questions. I mean, he's interested in questions of conversion. He was interested. He ended up in, uh, eventually becoming an Episcopal priest. Um, but he um but he said to me one time he said you know he says everyone all these mystics talk about this great ineffable experience and then they fill up books talking about this ineffable experience and it's um and and that always and that that struck me and stayed with me that you know if i ever had one of these experiences which lord help me that i should never have such a thing um I, I would I would just be completely undone. I would be like Isaiah. I don't know how I would ever write it down. I think I'd just run off into the forests and leave everyone behind. Well, so. Merton himself drew my attention to that that irony in connection with St. John of the Cross. If you remember going up the, the going up Mount Carmel, nada, nada, nada. You're constantly purging your mind of sense, you're per purging your mind of thought, you're getting to the ineffable, you're getting beyond any kind of reflective, or some people, not a, not another. But who who wrote more colorful poetry with all kinds of images than St. John of the Cross? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost the same thing, because I, I, I mean, I talk to my students about these things once in a while, but it's a... Um, I mean, it's almost I talk about an academic level, like the cloud of unknowing and things like this and what is going on, because, sure. I mean, our, our St. Gregory the Theologian makes references to these types of things. I mean, we're going through the theological orations right now in my one class, and he talks about, of course, he's against the eunomians, talking about the unapproachability of God and all. And um, But it does seem to be the, the fact that, it, I don't want to, it's not, I don't want to say it's irrational in the sense that it's anti-reason, but it's beyond reason as to how any of these things happen. And therefore, you know, how can grammar approach it? Uh, it, it seems to be the, the telling thing for me. Um, but we begin there. We begin there. You, you, you cited, and we read from, Don Jean Leclerc's book, um, the real title of the book, is is l'amour des lettres et des de Dieu, the love of letters and desire for God. In other words, if you start with literature, which means you start with grammar. And of right. course, he has a great deal to say about the importance of grammar uh, in, in the interpretation of scripture. Right. Well, so to swing back around then, I mean, you, you had mentioned uh, Merton's lectures on the prophets. And I know that when I think my first father introduction to you was um, your, your mailings on the readings from scripture. And you would talk about the different readings. Um, and this was back in the 90s. I'm still doing that, by the way. 
for some reason, I'm not getting this. I, 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 this, this is still all available online, Daily Bible. Okay. Flag. And I, I wrote the ones that are going to be posted on Friday. I wrote those all today. Okay. I'm, I'm, I somehow got another got bumped off the mailing list. I don't know how. But... We, uh, it's, it's, it's not really a mailing list. Oh. You follow. It's, it's, uh, or you, you just go on, you, if you go on my webpage. Okay. Nancy includes links to that ah, site. Okay. But it's on the it's, it's on the touchstone. If you give a subscription to touchstone, just go on touchstone. The daily Bible reductions are right there on right there in the uh, ah. You, you click right there in the touchstone site. They're they're right. available today. Okay. Well then, everyone else, please take note of that as well. And I will uh, I will post these in the pay on the page at Ancient Faith so that everyone can link to them for your own web page. Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. And so, um, so how would you? How how would you define describe? Let me say that's a better word. Describe to everyone uh, Merton's own approaches to Holy Scripture, and how do you feel like this influenced you as you approach Holy Scripture? All of us back in those days were beneficiaries of the encyclical that Pope Pius the Twelfth wrote about the study of Scripture, or at least the encyclical that was published. Uh, above his name. The encyclical itself was actually written by Augustin Bea, mm-hmm. who was a professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute, and who by the time I got to Rome was a cardinal. He actually wrote it. So the historical, modest, moderately critical approach to scripture was something we all took for granted. Uh, we were never going to read scripture um, as, as though, for example, not yet happened in the last thousand years in the interpretation of it. So that's why a, a great deal of stress was laid on the, the, the original languages. Um, when, when I was a, a young novice, and just, just after my 18th birthday, another novice named Father um, Hilarion Schmuck, a priest, Merton assigned him to translate for the other novices a French series of pamphlets on the various books of the Bible. The, the, the name of the series was Passa Passa avec la Bible, Step by Step with the Bible. And I remember the, the very first one that I, I read, he was, he was translating those, and I was in charge of the mimeograph machine. So I was running off the copies as he translated them, giving them all to the novices. Um, the very first one he did was Jeremiah. Well, that was very heady stuff. I was 18 years old. The only language I could read besides English was Latin. I didn't know, did not know enough Greek to do anything like that yet. And I had not yet learned any of the other languages that I, I picked up over the next decade. But to read Jeremiah through the historical setting of the 7th century, with the, with the decline of the Assyrian Empire, the rise of the Babylonians, the fall of the, the, the fall of Nineveh in 612, uh, the, the, the death of, of Josiah in 609, the Battle of the I get all this was all in the scriptures, and I was finding it there. It stimulated my imagination. I had an absolute thirst. I couldn't get enough of it. So at this time, they were putting out the, the Bible of Jerusalem, the Bible of Jerusalem. They were putting it out in fascicles. It wasn't a full volume yet. So I started, I learned French, taught myself French, and started reading reading this. I remember the very first one I read was the Gospel of John. Oh, come on, small, I la parole, and so forth. Uh, so I started, I read the entire Bible of Jerusalem. There was a big, thick 1,200-page book in double-column, small print called a Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. I read the whole thing, cover to cover. I read the Bible over and over and over again. And uh, I, uh, I started reading all kinds of French commentaries, and then I learned taught myself German and Dutch, so I could so I could. There was a good commentary on the Psalms in Dutch, so I taught myself Dutch, so I could read it, uh, and I taught myself Hebrew, so I could so I could so I could read in Hebrew, uh, 
anyway, I, I simply couldn't get enough of it. I found no contradiction between that pursuit, none at all, and using the scriptures in order to talk with God. A, a, a book that was very important to me back in those days was called Das Betrachtungsgebet, which I think is, is simply called On Prayer. Uh, with the, I read it four times in French before I, before I knew German, La, La, La Prière Complétive, written by Hans Urs von Baldassar. Mm -hmm. von Baldassar. And I found that book immensely helpful. Uh, I found no contradiction between a prayerful reading of Scripture and an intense, studious uh, knowledge of Scripture. But Merton, I, I, I learned that first from Merton. Yes. So going back to something you said some years ago at the, um, you spoke at the Florovsky Symposium, and I'm... Um, Were you there for that, for that? Yes, I was. Yes, okay. I was. And um, uh, I, I've kept trying to revise it. I don't know if it will, but I will say this, Father, that um, the St. Basil Society, which I'm the director of, we are now the possessor of Father Florovsky's literary remains. Um, oh, that's wonderful. That's, I'm, I'm so delighted to hear that. So they had fallen to, uh, they went They went to Father Matthew Baker, and after he reposed, his wife uh, passed them off to Father Joseph Lucas and Father John Cox. Father Lucas is now Father Dr. Joseph Lucas. Uh, he's dean of the OCA Academy. They had a group, and they joined with us, St. Basil Society. So in the next few months, we're actually going to arrive to um, uh, uh, print them. And um, so uh, we're basically, we're going to translate his lectures. We're going to translate the notes that need to be translated. We have people who do French. We have people who do and. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of fallen to, to our little press to do. Um, well, he wrote so. he wrote in a dozen languages. He's the only. How many other authors, uh, uh, Orthodox writers, can sit down and at will run off something in Swedish? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we are we have a big job ahead of us, and right now they're all sitting in an air conditioner that's Adamir's. You know, technically we own them, <laughs> uh, but but having said that, so I, I when you were at the Florovsky Symposium, um, you made this statement to uh, Edith Happiness uh, about the necessity of clergy knowing the ancient lines, and this is one of the things I was kind of more surprised of, is that many of our clergy know the languages. Um, and I'm I'm just one. I mean, I, I neither of us can really do anything to change all that. How well, did this I, I, I've, I've made my contribution. Uh, I I've sent a number of people to seminary, and I've had a number of people recommended for ordination. I never do that unless they can read the New Testament in Greek. I simply yeah. won't. Re I simply will not recommend anybody for ordination who cannot read the Word of God in Greek, at least Greek. Right. And it's, I mean, I have to confess that my Hebrew has fallen by the wayside. Well, I the Hebrew, Hebrew, is some, so Hebrew is something else. The, the official text of the Old Testament is itself Greek. Yes. He, yes. He, Hebrew, Hebrew is, that's a bit extra. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, right. I wouldn't insist on that. No. Right. No. But it, it is, and it's just some, I don't know, I would say it scandalized me, but maybe I should say it scandalized me, but it's just, it just seems like this should be something that, if you're an Orthodox clergy, you should be able to read. The, and 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 I was. It's almost the least that we can expect because it's not that difficult to learn New Testament Greek. Yes. Um, I, I I I did it. In, I did it one hour a day over a summer. By the end of the summer, I was reading. I was reading the New Testament Greek, and then went on to read the Septuagint and the Fathers of the Church, and then I started reading Plato and and uh, the cl classical works and so forth. But I, be I began with the New Testament. Yeah, I began there too. I picked up the classical Greek and Homer, which, which are closely related, but 
Um, uh, I, I tell my students, so I, I'm teaching Latin at a high school now, and basically I've, I've re- re- revised the whole Latin curriculum there because basically I want them when they're juniors and seniors to be reading uh, Sallust and Livy and on to Cicero and Caesar, and um, which they're not at all prepared to do now, but that's, that's kind of the state. But um, I tell them that when John Jay entered college when he was 14, Part of his entrance was to translate the first chapter of John out of Greek and into Latin. And this was, and he was 14. This was a common thing. And a lot of his learning he got from a local minister and from his mom. Sure. Yeah. By the way, several weeks ago, I started rereading the Gallic Wars. And the first time I had read Caesar, since high school, uh, it, it is it's just wonderful. I've, I've I've got I've got the Latin text there, and I've got I've got uh, this uh, the landmark series, which has, gives gives you all the maps. Because I, I I never followed the maps back when I was fourteen. I was struggling with the grammar. <laughs> it yeah, um, yes, Caesar's battle plans are just just it's just marvelous reading. So the core, the course that I have them on will get them into into uh, into into Caesar by you know by the end of this book that we're working through. So it's a college text, but these kids, it's a it's a classical co op school, but these kids are real sharp and they really are loving it. And I'm, it, I don't want to say it's made me young again, but it's given me enthusiasm to teach, because um, I still teach college. And the other night. I made reference um, to the end of the Baroque age and the classical age and uh, right. And I made mention of Bach and some kid looked at me and goes, who, who is box? And I looked at the other class and they just all stared at me. And then one student said, is that, is that like Johann Bach? And I said, well, it's like that. And I, I played him a bit of the, of the mass and then, um, uh, Yesu, uh, mine blight, right? Jesus, yeah, joy, yeah. man's desires. Well, when one of them heard that, she goes, oh, I know that. I know. And so these kids at this school, they have a hundred days of Bach. They're listening to Bach three times a week at this school. And so. Oh, that's wonderful. That's marvelous. Yeah. Oh, that, I that, so will sh- that will shape their souls. Yep. Yep. So anyway, uh, back to Merton. <laughs> Because we've chased these rabbits for a while, um, but you may well have answered this in, in your discussion. But um, how do you feel that uh, that Merton did Merton's own approach, as it were, to Holy Scripture? I mean, you said you both were uh, um, influenced by Pius the Twelfth in the encyclical. Is that pretty much, I would say, common ground then that you that was, that was common ground back then, right? When, when the, we never went into the higher, what they call the higher criticism, where you start actually doubting the text and things of this right. sort. And so much of so much of biblical scholarship back and even in those days was a distraction. You know, like the the two source theory, the synoptics, the four source theory, the Pentateuch. That's a distraction. That's just simply a distraction. Right. Um, I don't know if you ever met him. Um, do you know Father John Hunnick? It doesn't ring a bell. So Father John, he's he's one of these people that Bill Ty repeatedly refers to in his emails. Um, no, I have not met him. I know you're talking about it. I have not met him. No. So I, I've met him on a couple occasions when I was in Oxford. And he, he's a trained classicist. And he said that classicists are kind of appalled at biblical studies people who sometimes spend all their time questioning the text, particularly of the New Testament. C.S. Lewis made the same point. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Father John is a big lover of uh, Ronald Knox as well, who kind of made this same point. Right. Um, so Ronald Knox, by the way, did not know Greek. I thought most people are not aware of that. He did not know Greek. He translated his translation was from the Vulgate. 
I'm sorry. I'm just stupefied. That's why I'm speechless for a moment. It's just like that's almost beyond. Yeah, I got. I got that. I got that. I wouldn't have believed it, but I got that from no no less an authority than Father Barnabas A. Hearn. Wow. Well, I guess we all have feet of clay, don't we? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have call that feet of clay. My goodness, I love Ronnie Knox. Ronnie Knox was a a great writer. Oh and my! It, but, but he translated. He translated from the Vulgate. Right. Oh no! I his spiritual Aeneid was, I mean, a joy to read, and I mean, I go back to his enthusiasm quite often um, to basically warn me not to become too severe in my thought thought in theology. So, um, well, anyway, uh, Merton, by the way, read very little Greek. Yes. Hmm. But he was very much at home with Latin in any in any school of Latin. Right. Well, I mean, I mean that, that that's an. I mean, I remember this. When did you? So I, I will I will confess this that back in ninety four, you and a number of other people had met at Rose Hill College. Oh, uh, the Rose Hill Conference in ninety five. Yes. yes, and there were recordings of it, and. And you basically made the point that, you know, we Orthodox could never talk to the Catholics until we learned Latin, which I believe then and I believe now. And I will say this, that that, that, that conference, which I wasn't there, I was just listening to recorders that Bill gave me, um, that the thing that probably... I would say that was the, uh, to use Thomas Kuhn's phrase, was the uh, scientific revolution in my mind uh, that switched me or, or or switched me to the point where I radically changed my thinking uh, was um, Bill Abrams, Abraham's reply to your paper. And he talked about canonical revisionism. And he made mention of feminist theology and how they were writing a new midrash and all these things. And then he said, you know, if we look at the Reformation, the Reformation was really a uh, canonical revolt against the canon of tradition. And when he said that, that switched a light in my head that's never gone out. And... It suddenly made sense of so many things. The easiest one to talk about is um, when Eck debated Luther at Leipzig. And, I mean, most people look at the question of the councils. Eck pushed him into a corner about councils can err. But prior to that, uh, he had said to Luther, if your doctrine of justification by faith alone is correct, why need we pray for the dead? And this seems to be the first time that anyone's put this to Luther. And Luther immediately says, I deny prayers for the dead. And then X says to him, well, then what about Maccabees? And Luther says, I reject Maccabees. Uh, and so suddenly, that's how, that's how it came about. Okay, Right. And suddenly, uh, Luther's doctrine became the new canon rule of faith as to what is and isn't scripture. And and all of that from listening to that Methodist from down there in Southern Methodist University. He was a, a great yeah. loss. We lost him about two or three years ago, I think. Yes, he was a, a, a he was really quite a. His response to my paper was vastly better than my paper. I loved your paper. I listened to that a few times too. <laughs> so. It's been published three times, by the way. Okay, well, and, in, I, in, I, and in my contract, I'm allowed to publish it a fourth time if I ever. If we ever put out a, a collection of Pat Reardon's essays, it'll be published the fourth time. I'll, I'll line up to read it again. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we'll swing back to Mer Merton now, because um, <laughs> I know we swing wildly here. But, um, I mean, we've already mentioned, or you certainly mentioned, uh, Merton's anti-war stance, um, which... Uh, I mean, I, I grew up, I mean, I grew up a fundamentalist, which meant first and foremost that more than anything, I was probably an anti-communist. And, okay. sure, sure. 
And so, you know, the military was high on our list of things we honored. Um, you know, the flag, the declaration. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm from a I'm from a Navy family. Yeah. I mean, my father had dropped out of high school to join the Merchant Marines in the Second World War. Um, and uh, so all of that, you know, was right there. But, you know, I basically have become. I won't say I'm a pacifist, but I am really anti-war. And oh, so me too. I am so fed up, so fed up with the, the, the disposition of current political leadership. I mean, what country have what country in the Middle East have we not invaded right. in the last twenty? I'm, I'm, I'm just this. Oh, I don't know. I'm just I'm just so appalled in, in both both parties, both political parties. Right. Uh, I, I curse on both of them. They, there's, there's so many. I think we're being governed by war hawks now. I really do. The uh, well, I, I I saw somebody posted this, and and they weren't. It's basically the top five companies in which our Congress have their own personal investments. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And they were doing it to show that number five was Pfizer. Yes, yes. The top four were all military contracts. Yeah. Well, armaments, armaments, and 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 pharmaceuticals. I mean, they've been they've been running us for. I mean, who wanted who wanted that war? Right. Currently being engaged between. Two orthodox countries. Who wanted that war? Exactly. Exactly. It, it makes me ill. It makes me ill. And um, well, there, but we're, there were people who wanted that war and made sure that it happened. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I don't think it's a coincidence that we we backed out of Afghanistan no. and left everything there high and dry. So, um. But uh, but having said that, uh, and and I know, so I see. It, I, which, but going to Martin Merton, though, it's more than yes. being opposed to war. It's being so taken up with it mm. that you don't long and longer have the time or the energy to do better things, more in keeping with your vocation, and that was my objection to Merton. Right. It also put him in contact with some fairly seedy people too. It most certainly did, and it put some. It put it put Jim Jim Forrest in contact with some seedy people. Right. If you right. look at the if you look at the names on Jim Forrest's dust cover that recommend his autobiography, the people I wish whose names I would not want on any on, on my, any of my books. Right. Right. No, and it's it's interesting because there's. There's supposed to be a big peace rally at the end of this month down in D.C. And, and some of the people that are supposed to speak can't get along with some of the other people down there who are going to speak. And um, Oh, some, some of the most aggressive and hostile people I've ever met in Pacifist. Yes. <laughs> I mean... And, and the thing is that we can actually name names because these people oh, yeah. have been in prison. And, you know, I mean, yeah. I grew up in and around Baltimore and that's where some of them were doing some of their most ludicrous activities. Yes. And, 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 and toward the end of his, of his autobiography, rather wistfully, I think within the last 20 pages of the autobiography, Jim Forrest said, did ever did, he said there could have been one less person going to prison? And, made, and he talked about himself, okay, as as a draft protester, right? right. He says he says they could have done just as well without me. And, and I thought, oh, he, he at least he had second thoughts about it before he died, right? Well, that's good. Um, Jim I, was I very hope. Jim was very very self critical by the way. Yes. Like, what, of the charming things about him, he was very self-critical. But see, that's one of the charming things about Merton. Mm. Merton was very self-critical. It's it's hard to say things harshly about Merton that he didn't say about himself. Mm. Mm. That is a. Um, I would say that that's. I mean, it it that is a great gift. That is a great 
grace to be self-critical. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think there's a big difference, and maybe you can elaborate on this, between being self-critical and then also always plagued with self-doubt. Um, oh, they're, they're two quite different things. Right. Two very, and, uh, very different things. I would say that my one of my biggest besetting sins is years ago, um, I, I when I was finishing my PhD, I basically was having a great uh, surge of what they call imposter syndrome. And I told a friend of mine who had already finished his PhD, he was always he was already hired, he was a he was a rhetorician. Um and I just said, I just know that my committee, who was comprised of really big names, I said, I just know they're gonna call me someday and say, Jenkins, we know you are a fraud and you are out of this program. And he said, No, they're not gonna do that. I said, How do you know that? He said, because they had the same nightmare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, and so suddenly I I uh I don't think I ever had that nightmare anymore. But I try to be meticulous and crossing all my T's and dotting all my I's. And I know I still don't do it. And I come across things every now and then it's like, how did I not know this? Bill Ty one time said to me, he goes, you know, you really surprise me once in a while by the things you don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> But I don't think there's anything that Bill Tide doesn't know. I don't think so either. I mean, that is Mr. Footnote all the way through. <laughs> I, I, I had a colleague who did like modern British literature and modern culture studies. And, and he studied the history of science. And he basically studied history of science with respect to um, not the history of progress. This is kind of a University of Chicago affection that the history of science is the history of progress very positivistic so when he studied you know um uh uh it's going to say newman when he studied newton he was more interested in newton the biblical expositor and the alchemist than he was in newton the mathematician sure. and he came up with some bizarre reference one time we were all having drinks they come up with this bizarre reference about this recordings from the 30s and bill just started blurting out oh i remember that and he starts quoting them in this bizarre voice i yes, just almost yes. fell off my chair that bill would know this stuff so he's 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 he is, he is simply amazing he is simply amazing uh, i've sat by the hour and talked with him and it's a, it's, I would almost call it a quirk of his, but every single time he named somebody, okay, he threw in a parenthesis, which gave the date of birth and date of death. <laughs> he knew the date of birth and date of death. Did you name a, a, a day in history? Any, he tells you exactly what was happening that day. Everywhere in the Christian church, he knows the history of the church inside out. It's well, just he, quite marvelous. He, he, so he told me, I've made this reference on my show before, I'm almost positive, but when he was at George, he finished in the, he finished the top of his class at Georgetown. Yeah. And he said on Friday nights, he said no self-respecting Georgetown undergraduate would be caught dead in the library. But that's where I was because they didn't close. I would just pull books off the shelves and go sit in the corner and read. And he said when he was doing his doctoral uh, work at, at uh, Oxford, he at, at Cambridge, sorry, Bill, at Cambridge, um, he said, I would just sit in the library for hours reading church history and theology and instead of doing my work. And, um, and, and that's kind of how Bill's life is. That's really what he does. Well, and, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill is simply wonderful. <laughs> He's one of my absolute favorite people. <laughs> So he lives like he lives less than two miles from me and we don't see each other enough. We see each other. But the first time we met, we met by sheer. Well, it wasn't. It was God's providence. It was God's providence. We met and we sat down at a restaurant and four hours, four and a half hours and, and five beers later. It was like this was the. Best afternoon of my graduate career so far. 
yeah, Bill, Bill is Bill is one of the most extraordinary men I've ever known. It's, he know he knows so many things about so many people. I mean, he can tell you who the third cousin of almost anybody was. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, it's it's it's. It's uncanny. His memory is, is just, um, I won't say flawless, because every now and then he'll call me up and say, do you remember this? And I have to go, Bill, I'm not sure that I do remember that, but let me find out. But yes, I mean, it's just, um, it's the shocking odd tidbit that he doesn't remember. I I, I pride myself as one of the mighty great accomplishments in life. That on two occasions, and only on two occasions, I corrected Bill with a point of, after a point of history, but both of them were pre-Christian. <laughs> I'm sure he was happy to be corrected. Too. Oh, he was. Oh, yes. He's but such they, a gracious both man. Of them, both, of, both were pre, pre-Christian history. Mm, mm. Well, um, so you mentioned to me, I think, that... Um, that Jim missed his calling to be a literary critic, Jim Forrest. A literary, literary scholar. Yes. Uh, a literary scholar. And, and, and he had he had a full scholarship. I can't remember what university, but he had a full scholarship and did not take it on the urging of, of Philip Berrigan. <sighs> and I, I, when I read that. I read that. Jim says that in his own autobiography. Phil Berrigan talked him out of going to college. <sighs> so he could devote his life to peace activism. And I just, well, anyway, I don't want to speak, speak ill of the dead. And no. them, but, but, but Jim did not criticize Phil Berrigan for said, giving him that, but he, he was he came clean on it. Phil Berrigan told, told him, don't bother with college. Wow. And this is back in the days when a college education meant something, unlike now. Right. Right. Uh, that is, yeah. I mean, I, I I had a student, she had a full ride at Catholic University in a PhD program, Medieval History. And she dropped out of it. She said because she couldn't stomach any more historiography. Um, and as one of my colleagues said, that's the price you pay to get a PhD is you have to stomach historiography. I love historiography. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it too, and, I mean, uh, but it's my favorite she, form of reading. Well, I mean, I was happy that that a lot of the people I sat under were just so gifted in in, in talking about it. Sure, and I and I imagine at CUA they didn't have that. I don't know, but I did tell her that. Well, Danny, you you probably you may have made the right choice. She went into teaching high school. Well. She went into teaching high school before she started having babies. Now she's home. And, um, but she was just, she was, she was the best Latin student I'd ever had until this past year. Um, and, um, but she, I, I basically told her, I said, there's actually now vanishingly few things you can do, even with a good PhD. Um, and, and, and there's growing little things that people can do with a college degree. I mean, there are still good colleges out there, but I'm just, I'm appalled. It, it, it's, in, it's in a state of crisis now. Yes. Yeah. Um, relative to Merton, again, did the name Dan Walsh ring a bell with you? He was Merton's professor. Uh, at, 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 he, was a, he was an adjunct professor at, at, at Columbia. He was full-time professor at the Manhattanville College of the Sacred Heart, where he taught all four of the Kennedy girls, plus Ethel. Mm. But he was Merton's philosophy professor and wanted to introduce Merton to the works of Mary Tan and Chilson. Dan is the one who got me hired at Bellarmine. Dan, Dan, wow. Dan and I were very good friends. That's very... That's, I, I had no idea, actually, none. Um... So we notice uh, in the Seven Story Mountain the importance of Dan Walsh, along okay. with Mark Van Doren. Those are two right. major professors he had in his life: Martin, Mark Van Doren and Dan Walsh. Mm. Literature from one and, and philosophy from the other. Right, right. 
Oh, okay. Ah. Um, how, how is it, Father, that you ended up going from Gethsemane to San Anselmo? Well, I was sent there. Yes. I was, I was, a when I was a young monk, uh, it was pretty obvious to me within six months of in the novitiate that I was going to have to do something if I was going to remain sane. Because there was the, the life I was living and the personality I had living it was not conducive to sanity. Hmm. And I was always on the verge of a nervous breakdown and had terrible spiritual struggles. Mm. But uh, I resolved about six months in Vichate. We had an enormous library, and I just determined to read it. So I read the library. Uh, in order to do that, I had to teach myself a bunch of languages, but I just, I just read the library. And well, this came to the notice of, of my superiors, and they wanted me to further my, so they sent me to, to study over in Italy. So You've, you've already told, you've already mentioned John, Father Jean the clerk a bit, Don Jean, and um, I knew him at Gethsemane because he was a frequent, frequent visitor. But later on, when I was at San Anselmo, I, I did my my, my thesis was, uh, I, which I wrote in Latin, by the way. That was the only language you were allowed to write in San Anselmo. Everything had to be written in Latin. So I wrote my thesis in Latin. It was a study of the works of. Um, um, the Baldwin of Canterbury or Baldwin of Ford. Um, at, at that time, that's before the critical edition came out in, in the CCL, the mm -hmm. Corpus Christi Norum Latinorum. That's, the, that's a critical edition. The, there wasn't any critical edition in those days except the, his treatise on the Blessed Sacrament, which appeared uh, in Sous Chrétien and John, edited by John Morrison. The other works were all contained in volume 204 of Means Latin Patrology. And uh, and there was very, very little secondary literature. I did that on purpose uh, because I, I, had, I had to get this done. Right. Uh, and so I, I, picked, I picked an author that I actually could handle in part time over the course of a year while I was cramming four years of theology in his son and some of, uh, in one year. But Don, Don, Don Jean Claire was my second reader. My, my, the, the moderator of my thesis was Don Kalati, uh, the, the, the um, Master General of the Commodities Hermits, hmm. who, lived, who, lived, who lived, over at, lived over on the Aventine Hill at St. Gregory's Monastery, from which, of course, the monks went and left to go to Canterbury in 596. Right. And um, do you still have a copy of that, or is it in the uh, archive? Yes. I have. I have a typed copy. In those days, I, I typed this all on an Olivetti portable with very thin paper. And back in those days, you had to actually hit the keys. Right. But that's the only copy I have. That's the only copy I have left. But it's in Latin. It's in Latin, and I, I'm not disposed. I wrote it in Latin. It's not, I'm not disposed to translate it into English. It, it's something, it has to do with my heavens, that's 55 years ago, 56 years ago. Well, I, I, the temptation is running from my mind to say, I'd love to see it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the next time I'm in Chicago for the uh, Touchstone Conference, which will be, uh, well, not too soon. So I think uh, I've got, I think, I think I've got a standing. In, in, in a shelf that includes the works of St. Bernard, the works of St. Anselm, Gary Gavigny, and other people who lived just about that around that time. Uh -huh. Gary, Gary, Gary Gavigny's works, of course, were published with the works of St. Bernard in the mm -hmm. four volumes of Mean. Uh, I think it's 183 to 186, something like that. I don't know because I, I I I came across the works of Bernard in a critical edition. I think that was done in the John, And that's John Leclerc's. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's where I read him at Rutgers, um, and and I and I have to say that um, that my professor at uh, um, at Rutgers, Carl Morrison, um, 
you, you reminded me of him because he's the first one I ever heard call him Bernard as opposed to Bernard, which everybody, Bernard. yes. In the, in, the, in the order, he was always called Bernard. Bernard, yes. So, um, and um, so in, in thinking about. Um, Bernard is the name of a dog, an alpine dog. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, name for a German pass, I think. So, <laughs> the um, so so in thinking about uh, uh, Dom Jean Dom Jean Leclerc, I I I know that our our um, our sources for theology should be first and foremost and almost always Scripture. Do you think that he affected how you approach theology? No question way? about it. No yeah. question. His book, uh, The Love of Letters and the Desire for God, was a very, very important book, along with von Balderson's book on contemplative prayer. And also also those four volumes. It, by the way, it's four, not just two. There's four volumes of, uh, of Exeges Medieval by, by Henri de Dubac. I read those as they came out. Yeah. Uh, they came out. They came out as two volumes. Erdman's published them as two volumes. There's four, four in Latin, four in French. Oh, yes, yes, in the French. Yes, I never read it in English. Oh, okay. Um, I've only seen the French. I haven't read the French. So, um, I mean, I probably should get it. I've got several of his other books in French, which I only have in French. They, um, they may, they may, they may be difficult to get these days. Yes, they may very well be. I mean, even even Jean Leclerc's autobiography, I think it runs about eighty dollars. Wow, wow. Um, mm. Mm. Is that well? Is that different than his? He has a short book of memoirs. That's it. That's the one. Oh no, they just republished that because um, I did. I bought that a little while back. Um, it sent me the sent me the send me the source because when I yeah. when I checked it out some time ago, it yeah, was I pulled uh, this up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that they, it was awfully expensive online. If if you if you can get for less than eighty dollars, let me know. I will. I will. I will. Uh, um well you, you mentioned being a bit um degage there at the uh, at, at Gethsemane. Did you was it a difficult place to pray? Was it? I mean, I had someone once time tell me St. Tikhon's was an event, either coming or going, and he didn't understand how people could be monks there. Was was Gethsemane like that? Gethsemane was very busy. Oh. Yeah. When I went, when I joined, there were well, well over two hundred monks, mm. and and we all lived together. You you, you had no privacy of any kind. Uh, you slept in a common dorm, for example, all your meal. And fortunately, we, we did live on several hundred acres, which was a lot of woods. Right. And so and, and um, on Sundays, for example, I would each Sunday after after the mid noon meal and before Vespers, I would take I would take one of the Folger's uh, volumes of, of, of Shakespeare. And every Sunday, I would go out and read a Shakespeare play in the, in the woods. <laughs> that that was that was light reading for for Sundays. But probably, I mean, I mean, you're you're telling me this. It strikes me because I'm thinking in in my mind of Saint Gregory Palamas that he would live out in the woods all week, and then come in on Sundays. Right, Saturday night and Sunday to meet with that, the brother. That, that, that would that be that'd be closer to the Athenite tradition, right? But but remember, remember the Cistercians of the strict observance, right? In those days, had a great deal more to do with almost Jean de Monsey than the, than with Bernard Gravel. Mm. There was an enormous, enormous stress on asceticism, tremendous asceticism. Oh, I'm not. Not only not only the rules that are in the rule of Saint Benedict, because rule of Saint Benedict, there's there's not the slightest suggestion of any prohibition, for example, on dairy products, cheese, uh, fish, mm. none, none at all. Whereas in, in the in the Trappist reform, 
It was no milk, no, no, uh, no, 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 well, you could have cheese, but you couldn't have eggs or fish. You know? mm. it, it was very rigorous. The rising was at two o'clock in the morning, for example. I don't, I don't rue any of that, by the way, because I did learn to pray there. I did learn to pray. Right. But the atmosphere of the house was very much a pressure cooker, mm. which, I, which I think is why I wanted to go out in the hermitage. Ah. Uh. I mean, reading um, Jean Leclerc's memoirs, I mean, all of this was pre-Vatican Council, um, and he's talking about almost, it, 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 it paints a, a, a religious landscape in the Catholic Church that is unrecognizable now yeah, um, right. in the sense of the amount of Benedictine institutions throughout the United States and Carmelite uh, uh, institutions. I mean, I know, I know the Carmel, uh, the Baltimore Carmel is still there. Uh, I think they have about 15 nuns there, but the, the one in Louisville, the one in Louisville that I knew as a child was gone long gone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I mean, my, um, so my, my confessor, Father Tom Edwards, he is 85 now. That's, a, he good, that's a good age. That's a good age. A very good age. Uh, his, his health is declining, but he's always so happy. And he had grown up in town, um, gone to Georgetown. And uh, while he was there, uh, someone he was in the School of Foreign Service. And not, it's not the School of Foreign Service. What is that called? Uh, it's one of Georgetown's. Co anyway, um, but he had to take two <clears throat> languages. He was going to take French and Arabic. And someone said, this is the Cold War. Take Russian. So he took Russian with some Jesuit who told him, says, oh, if you want to know what the Russians are about, go over here to the cathedral. And oh, so he yes. Did. Yes, the cathedral in Washington, of course. Yes. Or my and daughter so, used to go to church. Well, he said um, his Franciscan confessor blew up at him and said, if you want that, we have that. You can have that, meaning the Unia. And um, he ended up going to uh, St. Cyril Methodius outside of Pittsburgh. I know it well. And he said that after about six years of seminary there, a number of them got so tired of hearing how so like the Orthodox they were, they all decamped, like five or six of them decamped and went to St. Vlad's. A whole bunch of people did that, even when I lived in Pittsburgh. They were still doing that. Yeah. Mm. They, they were getting all their identity by reference to orthodoxy. Well, we're, we're just like the orthodox. It was, yeah. Why not be orthodox? Right. So one night, uh, he, was, he was at my house. Bill was there. And Father Tom just, just said, he just says, you know, I've never really been tempted, but if I wanted to go back to Rome, the church I left doesn't exist. And that's, and I can think about like the mass and things like that, but it's so much more than that. Like the whole monastic culture seems to have just disappeared. Um, you know, to read that, to read uh, Leclerc's memoirs. So, um, and, and I do think, I mean, I'm sure you probably agree that we could use a lot more monasteries in our own country, Orthodox monasteries. Well, oh, I, 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 absolutely. I, mean, I love, I just love the, 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 the atmosphere in the Orthodox monasteries. You know, I was, I was the priest at, at Elwood City for about five years mm. and, and, uh, and served in my liturgy for the nuns there every week. Uh, and it just, it just, it was very relaxed. Congenial, they were. They were it was serious, but right. I didn't. I didn't see that nervous drive that I remember from Gethsemane back in the fifties. Ah, uh, uh, So this this brings up a side question that I've always wondered about: Did nuns serve in the sense in the altar at, in any way, or were you own back there? Or in Edward City? Yes. Yes, there was. It was. An elderly sister, sister, mother Elizabeth. She was she was 
sort of an acolyte. Okay. Uh, and she would come and present me with the censor and, and things of this sort. Uh, usually, usually just one. Right. Usually just right. one. Uh, yeah. It would be, would be licensed by the bishop to do that. Okay. I, I just, that for some reason I heard that elderly nuns were allowed within the altar, but by way of permission. I think that's, I think it's by way of permission. And sometimes they're not, they're not always elderly. Oh, I remember, okay. I remember there was one younger sister who was there for, uh, who was assisting me, I think sister, uh, Mother Elizabeth out of town or something. This young, 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 younger nun who eventually went over and became a nun in Greece, by the way, became a nun in Greece. Anyway, uh, anyway, there, there was a younger nun there for a while. Okay, all right. But but the okay. bishop's permission is what's needed. Right, right. So, um, so this is one of my two podcasts, and my other one is on church history. And I have um, my 52nd episode was I just taped it today and kind of one, for lack of a better term, the problem of, of St. Constantine, that um, wh why do we call this rather brutal man a saint? And I said, why we call him a saint? It doesn't make him less of a brutal man. But regardless, um, a few weeks ago, I had kind of gone over. Uh, Arianism. And I made the point that has now seemed to have come back in vogue in, sc in scholarly literature that one of the great problems with the Arians was they all had rejected allegorical interpretation. And they all had predicated of Christ, as it were, the single subject in the sense that the Christ who suffers must be the Christ, the Christ who is, right? So for Arius, if Christ suffers, well, Christ is not God. He is a creature. Um, and so, and, and of course, this was a point made by Newman, right? For Newman, it was this rejection of allegory in Antioch. Uh, not that he's saying Ant that the whole Antiochian school was to be disregarded, but that this was what set Antioch against um, that was Alexander. that was the disposition. That was the disposition, right? And so, um, so in, about that, and in thinking about the Lubach, and back to uh, exegesis medieval, how does that? How have you seen that play out in your own scriptural exegesis, in your own handling of scripture and sermons and things like that? So, I mean. I mean, to be honest, I'm 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 a layman. Like I'm not even a reader. And um and when I read scripture, I mean, maybe this is my disease as a historian. That's always how I read it, even though I know there's so many deeper things there. The, so the, the fourfold sense of scripture. The first one I think to put it out as fourfold is it I think it's in I think it's in conference 17 of Cashin, I think. I think that's the first time we actually get four the four four sense of scripture. Because there were is uh, in um, in the Lubach's book, Histoire d'Esprit, he talks about two streams within origin. One in which the, the moral sense precedes the doctrinal, and the other in which the doctrinal sense precedes the moral. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how one is based on, 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 on the actual experience of the catechumen, and the other is based on um, a tripartite division of the soul in, in Plato. But when you get it down to four, that became the norm. It became, it, not, just the, not just the medieval uh, monastics, but the scholastics. I mean, Thomas Aquinas argues for four senses of scripture, exactly. If, and he advises them exactly with the same examples, in fact, that are used in Cashin. Yeah. So, so that, um, I've always seen a fourfold structure in the Word of God. There's history and literature and memory, and that's all there. 
but it's transformed in Christ, which gives, gives you allegoria. Or as, it, as Galatians says, allegumena. These things are said figuratively. From that flows the moral, the anima in Christo. And, and that leads and that leads to uh, contemplative prayer, the anagogi. My first scripture has always been I, I, all those things are, are, are that's how I read the Bible. So I will read I will read I will read Jeremiah, for example, in his historical context in the seventh century. Then I will read Jeremiah the way St. Paul does. But Paul is clearly in Galatians. He's relying on Jeremiah's experience. But he talks about his own being called, for example. Remember that? that whole, the one who knew me before I was born. This is Paul. That's the way Paul, Paul is reading Jeremiah through his Christian experience. So there's Christ. Okay? There's the soul. The reason I read scripture is that I can commune with God in the truth. God speaks to me in the Bible. I speak back to him in prayer. And all of that, the, the primary place where that happens, of course, is in the Psalms, where both things are going on. And then sometimes it does lead to wordless prayer, a quiet resting in God. In my case, that, that will not be not be very long. Uh, I, the, uh, the expression that, uh, that St. Bernard uses is, uh, Horrara e brevis. Rare and sharp. Horrara e brevis. So anyway, I've, I've, never, I've never found that a, an intense literary study, historical study of the scripture, in any way uh, in opposition to prayerful reading of scripture. Never, there's never been a problem with it. Right. And By the way, I treat this in my introduction to the Book of Chronicles. In my commentary on Chronicles, I go through the four senses of Scripture, and, and I show how I, I, I tend to modify it with an appeal to Bonaventure's thesis, of, of Bonaventure's category of theoria, theoria, in, in, in uh, St. Bonaventure's uh, treatise on the uh, on the uh, the uh, uh, hebdomada of the seven days of creation. Right. Okay. Well, then I will also put a link. Uh, I'll put a link to Ancient Faith, but also to Amazon for your Chronicles. Because that's what one of your texts I don't have. Like I have Christ in the Psalms and in Fathers. And, At the uh, time I wrote it, that was the most mature book I had written. Okay. Because I, I was going to ask you, what would you recommend to Orthodox out there to read on this? And um, the... Uh, my, my introduction to my introduction to Chronicles. Chronicles, yeah. I would I would say on just a on just a side note that um Jean Danielou uh talks about the fourfold sense in origin, but not as an explicit thing in origin. Um, it, 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 there, you can get the four senses out of origin. Right. But right. you'd have to you'd have to take two different two different ways he does it. Right. 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 Uh, oh my. Um Danielou was I don't think he was nearly so well informed on this matter. He most people don't realize that that was a big difference between Daniel Lu and De Lubach. See, Daniel Lu, Daniel Lu thought typology is correct, allegory is wrong. Right. Well, the word the word typologia never appears in either Greek or Latin fonts ever. You will not find it. You will not find. It. You will not find it in Dukanj, for example. You will not. You will not find it in in in, 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 in the patristic Lampa, the patristic Greek. The word doesn't exist. Typology is something that comes from German literary criticism that has nothing to do with fathers of the church. The study of types is called allegory. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's actually a blind spot that I have about Daniel Lu, because, I mean, I he had that threefold. Uh, that three-volume work on uh, on theology leading up to Nicaea, on right. uh, the Latins, the Greeks, and then and then the Hebrew background. Uh, he has a very good study of origin, um, and then um, 
well, I got a gift card for Amazon. So I'm looking through what do I want to buy? What do I want to buy? And there's this typology. Well, I scarf this up. And of course, it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> so um, I haven't I haven't finished it at all. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I served on the Illusion Mass once. Oh, yes? <laughs> yes. Oh. I, and I, when I was talking to him afterwards, I did not point this out. <laughs> oh, my. So, oh, okay. Um, so, so a very, very quick question. You said one time that you had, you had spent the afternoon with the Lubach during the council? Is I, that I, yeah, it, 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 in Rome. That's the only time I actually met the Lubach. Uh, he, was, he was always one of my heroes, and he had an enormous influence on me in my early 20s. Mm. In, in fact, through, through, through my 20s. Uh, his his exegesis medieval was one of the most important books in my formation. Um, there are other aspects of, of the Lubach I'm I'm less happy with. Uh, for example, his 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 fondness for and and uh, his comfort with the, the thinking of of, of uh, Tyre de Chardin. Uh, you knew right and, where you were going. <laughs> yes, Tyre Chardin is. For, me that no 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 that's not christian i'm sorry that's not, not christian you, you don't get you just put a, a jesus label on the end of evolution um, and that's all i see tired here Dan, right? but i did spend an afternoon with with uh Dulu bach um in, in rome during vatican ii and he was he was one of the theological advisors there with other people like rotzinger and carl ronner and, and so forth so I um I I mean I I love I love reading all of them honestly and um though I like Hugo Rahner better than I like Carl Rahner absolutely 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 Hugo Rahner was a great patristics and medieval scholar yes he was not a speculative theologian who wrote very complicated German and in fact Hugo Rahner is quoted as saying that someday he was going to say he was going to translate his brother's works into German. So I, I have to tell you this joke. And um, it was uh, one one day, uh, right at the beginning of his pontificate. Uh, was it, oh, no, no, it was, it was before his pontificate. Uh, C Cardinal Ratzinger has Father Hugo Rahner over, and they're drinking coffee. And and then Bishop uh, Cardinal Ratzinger looks at, at Father Hugo and says, Father Hugo, who do you think was the greatest theologian of the 20th century? And Hugo just looked at him and says, why, why my brother Carl? And Ratzinger dropped his coffee cup and he looked and goes, your brother is Carl Bart? <laughs> That's a cute joke. That's Father cute Matthew joke. Baker told me that joke and I know he didn't believe it either. <laughs> Anyway, um, I, I, there are parts of Rahner that I, I'm very fond of, uh, and there are parts of Rahner that I'm less happy about. Yes, uh, he. I, I don't believe the goal was to be to humanize people. I think the goal, goal was to divinize people. Mm. Yeah, no, I I only own a couple things by Karl Rahner. I own a good number of things by Hugo Rahner, and have just always enjoyed reading everything. Um, by him and um, von Balthasar, I have left stuff of the most 20th century Catholic I have is uh, is actually Father A. Nichols. Of um, course, of course. And then, yeah. Um, and I remember uh, I I was having coffee with Father John Unick, and and Father John was just he loved Ratzinger Benedict, and. And then, then I stopped. And I said, and 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 then we started talking about all these others. He had very little regard for Rahner, more so for von Balthasar. And I says, and and, uh, and the Lubach, and he says, well, he kind of taught Ratzinger, so I've got to kind of love him, don't I? So, anyway, Father, do you have any final thoughts? I've kind Father, of run don't out forget, of questions. Don't forget, don't forget, you're also punk. Oh. The two, two theologians of the 20th century I most trust and feel most congenial with 
or Ratzinger in Yaroslav Polygon. Um, so this is another whole conversation, but... A Pelican, by the way, I had lunch with Pelican years ago when I was a student of Southern Baptist Seminary. Oh, so Bill knew Pelican at Yale. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he's told you this story that a young lady basically asked him the question. She goes, Professor Pelican, are you a religious man? And he stopped and he says, yes, I am. He says, in fact, I'm a minister. I'm a Lutheran minister. And then he pauses. But I'm not going to die a Lutheran. Yes. I, I has told me right. Yes. Um, but the other thing is that um so Pelican told Pelican told Tom Tom, Tom uh, Hopko that he finally you know how he joined I think he was eighty four when he joined the Orthodox Church. Okay. He said, I was just tired of riding around that helicopter, I was going to crash or land. So, one of his first books is entitled Fools for Christ, in which he takes a very dim view of natural theology, or what is called natural theology. I mean, right. it's very Bardian. Yeah. And I have a nephew who was an Anglican, uh, doing slowly doing his doctoral work, he says, what can I do for a dissertation? And I said, you can do it on Pelican, on his trajectory from Fools for Christ to Christianity and classical culture. That's a best and, word. And it's like, well, we better get a move on before someone else writes it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an amazing trajectory. And a friend so, of mine, um, who was doing his, his doctoral work up in Ann Arbor was he, he was in a, a graduate in the graduate school and Pelican came and had lunch with the graduate students exactly the way I had lunch with him and he's sitting across the, the table from this man from this man and Pelican stood by way of making conversation and said uh, and and what are what are you what what are you pursuing he said, he said, uh, medieval Latin philosophy. He says, and how is your Arabic coming? How is your Arabic coming? Because right. the, the texts they're working with are translated from Arabic. Yep. Well, the, St. Thomas Aquinas is, 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 is reading a Latin text from, from Arabic. Yep. And it's a Greek text to, to, to Arabic to Latin. They didn't read Greek. In right. the Latin they were reading, you know, uh, I, I, I believe that probably the grammar they were using was the one that was done by Hermann Her 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 of, of Reganel, a Latin, a, a Greek, a, a, a Arabic grammar in Latin. Yes. If my memory serves, when I was young back then. I'm almost positive, Father, that your memory is correct. I won't say I'm 100%. I'll call Bill right when we're done. Bill will know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say that, uh, I mean, I've never, I mean, I've always admired Pelican, that he he could write about Bach, and then he could write about Faust. Yeah. And yeah. his little book on Faust is amazing. And so, yeah. Um, he was I, one of the directors, not, not, he, 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 sort of like board of directors of the Library of Congress. That's just how you sum it. Ah, uh, okay. Because I knew he had for a long time was involved in the editorials of, of putting all of Luther's works together. Oh, oh yes, he was. He was. He edited good works of Luther. Yes. Yes. But yes. when the, when I heard him lecture at Southern Baptist, when he wasn't a lecture, it was just a little after dinner talk with the students, uh, with his major students. Uh, he scandalized my my fellow Baptist students. Uh, <laughs> By, by saying that he, he definitely preferred Erasmus to Luther. And then they were, I mean, they were quite shocked by this. <laughs> of course, I, wasn't, I remember, I wasn't a Baptist. I was just going to school. No, 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 no. Oh, oh. I wish I could have been there. But anyway, there's many in my life. So, oh, Father, 
Father, I really appreciate you taking the time out to, to speak tonight and um, to join. I mean, do you, if you have any other things to say, I am happy to hear them. I am all ears. I just have student papers to grade on Candide, which I'm not looking forward to. Oh, but it has to get done. It oh, it does done. have to get done. Yes. Right. Uh, well, right. this interview will appear also on, on my webpage. Thanks, thanks to Nancy Hall, who's been recording all of this. Uh, and I think this will be a somewhat different fair than the, than the folks on my webpage usually get. <laughs> well, well, Father, I do have one last question. I always end my uh, interviews with this, and that, and that is, Father, what has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, the the stimulation of my memory. It's a great part of the soul. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gary. I appreciate this. Father, thank you very much as well. And Nancy, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.